Yeah. Worry 21, I popped it up on the screen already because, uh, yes, awesome. Uh, I need this intro song to pump me up every morning. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> DJ Brent Contained, here we go, here we go. Uh, good to see you, Alex Masha. I hope you had a good day off yesterday. Um, yes. All right. Well, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I mean, I think you're going to do the talking, but, um, Crap. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, listen, as far as I know, we're going to be talking. So this week we've talked a lot about ECR and, you know, I think we're going to, right, we're going to stick with the theme of, of container registries, but today we're going to talk about, as Alex Smasha put it, using Docker registry, uh, like a Docker registry is a pull through cache. Yeah. You know, and. I mean, we're just going to jump right into it because we're going to kind of combine a couple of things together. We're going to talk about that. But also, I just, for for uh, giggles, decided let's also deploy one using Copilot. So, um, so yeah, we're going to, like, mix Copilot up with uh, Docker Registry, and uh, we're just going to see what comes out. Um, but let's talk real quick about, like, why. Why would you even want to have a pull through cache? Um, and when I think about it, I, you know, I think about it in terms of like, think about all the artifacts that uh, that you have to deal with when you're dealing with your services. You know, you might have like an NPM, a set of uh, node packages that you depend on. You might have um, Python packages that you depend on, Ruby gems, et cetera. <laughs> there he is, right on. Um, and when that's the case, what do you typically do? You typically figure out how to store those locally so that if NPM is ever having a problem or uh, you know if something is ever removed upstream, you're not left in a lurch. And then also it can help you from a speed perspective. You don't have to reach as far across the internet to download something. Uh, bandwidth, I mentioned in, in my tweet, you don't necessarily spend as much on bandwidth because uh, you're not downloading those artifacts over and over again repeatedly. You know, if you have a, let's say you have a 500 node cluster and you're going to deploy a daemon set on that cluster. Um, and the daemon set is a 100 meg um, image of some kind. I don't know. Splunk forwarder, who knows what it is. I have no idea how big anything is anymore, but still, let's just let's just do math real quick. Adam, can you do this math? What is 100 megs times 500? Like 50,000. Megs, 50,000 megs, 50 gigs? Is that what that ends up being? Megs divided by 1,024. <laughs> be like 50 <laughs> megs, yeah, 48, yeah. It's yeah, right. like, yeah, and you know, I mean, you don't necessarily have to do that, right? You could have it in a cache and have it just sitting there waiting for uh, when it's ready to be downloaded, and then it'll download faster, and you won't and you won't have uh, you know those all those gigs just burned up for no good reason. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's that's pretty cool. Nethole, uh, what if a container of a registry? Ca <laughs> yes, actually, no, we are going to run a container of a registry cache. So it is quite meta for sure. We aren't going to cache our container of our registry cache. That would be just ludicrous. <laughs> and Texan Raj, yeah. cache is king. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, what's that saying, though? There's only there's only two hard things in in computing, uh, cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. Sounds about right. That joke just totally flew <laughs> over your head, didn't it? <laughs> two, there's only two hard problems. I, I know, I, I know, I know. It's, it, listen, it's a, it, That's it's the a off by one me. error. Oh, it's so good, so good. Um, well, anyway, we're gonna keep it simple. I'm not promising anything, but at the end of the show, hopefully you have an idea of just how caches work, how this cache works. 
but we're not going to have like a production deployment of this that you can take away and go implement yourself but you might have some ideas and that's really what i wanted what i hope to get out of out of today is to just give you some ideas of things you could explore for your own environment because in the end uh, you might want to implement this in a Kubernetes sort of way, or uh, you might want to implement it for ECS, or you might want to implement it for, you know, Docker Swarm or something, you know, something else. Like there's just all kinds of options that you'll have available to you. So I just, you know, I just want you to be thinking and, and know what you're getting yourself into. Um, all right. So is, I mean, should we should we get started? <laughs> Let's do it. I I feel bad. I'm just sitting here kind of spectating. I, I haven't said many words, but let's do it. All right. Uh, I mean, all right. So let's just talk real quick. And this this you tell me this stuff. Like, so what is a container image? What's it made up of? What is it we're we're going to be doing here? Well, I mean, a container image at the end of the day, right? The the lowest level is just it's a tarball, right? Yeah. It's just a, a tarball of, and then, you know, your image consists of layers. So you have each lay, a layer, which we did, by the way, I think we went over this in one of our shows. We did, yeah. I feel like I should find that and reference it here. But, you know, when you think each layer represents um, a, a set of instructions in your Docker file, right? It so was Justin with Legos. I remember it. That's right. Yeah. Best demo ever. Best yeah. demo ever. Um, yeah, and so props, look, look, props to look, Justin. Uh, always. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> see, I'm waking up now. I got. Oh, good, it. good. Real Adam has just joined us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm still asleep. It's a long week. You know, it's been a long week, long Man, busy week, no doubt. Um, but yeah, and then so ultimately, a registry is just this is where we store those those tarballs, those images. Yeah, and, we're we're yeah. storing. We're storing those layers, those images, those tarballs, and we're then also storing the blob of metadata that describes how to reassemble them, how they all fit together and stuff like that. So when you first reach out to a registry, you're you're asking it for a reference point, you know, pull redis colon latest. And it's going to find the blob that describes Redis latest and all of the parts that make up Redis latest. And then you're going to end up retrieving all of those bits. And then you reassemble them locally on your, on your client side. So all we really need is something that can uh, cache the blobs and cache the layers. And as it turns out, Docker actually gives us software that can do this. Um, it's the Docker registry. So you can run Docker registry yourself and you can like Docker pull, Docker push into it and have your own registry if you like, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is taking that same image, that same software and using it as, cache, as a caching layer. And it, and it has functionality for that. And the functionality is limited to just caching from Docker Hub. So, there are other ways that you might think about caching if you're wanting to cache from Quay or from uh, GCR or ECR or anything like that. But uh, when it comes to caching from Docker hubs, which is what we're going to do today, um, this works great. So let's just use what they what they provide us. So, yes, and I I do want to add like it's not limited here. There's like there's plenty of solutions out there. Like you know like one that comes to mind is like JFrog Artifactory. It's another yeah. way that you can, you know, that's obviously beyond, it's not just tied to Docker images, right? This is also your package modules and, and so on, but it's another way right. to have a, a pull through cache uh, mechanism as well. Exactly. So. Exactly. So, you know, let's just explore, let's give you something to think about and uh, we'll, you know, we'll see where we, where we land on the other side of all of this. So um, I'm working I, I figured I felt like today, just because I was in the Bay Area last week, um, I, I felt like I should work from uh, Northern California, the region uh, today. 
Giving US West One some love, huh? I know, right? I never get to use US West One. Uh, sadly, I swapped over to it last night to prep for all of this, and I discovered I had a cluster running there for eight the last 18 months. Um, <laughs> so, surprise, uh, I, I went ahead and cleared that up. Um, so that's all good. Oh, Very look, cool. Alex. Man, Alex Smasher, we need to hire him. He's our um, moderator. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alex. Uh, he even got down to the minute, 1830. Uh, that's awesome. And of course, Alex, what website could you go to to find all of our videos? <laughs> Wait for it. I know. I'm waiting for the second or two delay. But we, Brent, we really need to get our T-shirt thing going. I like. Yeah. We gotta get this. Get this going. We do. We do. I that. <laughs> Okay, I'll take that. I'll take that as a correct answer. Uh, absolutely, containersfromthecouch.com. And yes, I need to get I need to get working on uh, t-shirt design. I want it to be awesome. I've been trying out all kinds of soft t-shirts, looking for the very softest. And um, now I need to figure out where I found one that's like so soft that it it makes sheet jealous. So like, you know, wow. it's, it's like incredibly soft. Um, and so I, I need this in my life. I know, but now I need to figure out how do I buy it? Like in, how do I buy them in bulk so that we can screen print on them instead of just buying them from the retail place that I happen to run across them. Got it. Yeah. Sounds like a challenging situation. But it's awesome, man. It's awesome. I have a green one and um, it's got no logos on it. So it is perfect. You know, like it would be. Can you send that to me privately, please? I'll <laughs> I'll think about it. I, I mean, I, <laughs> we already dress two alike. So I don't necessarily want you to have the same shirts that I have. <laughs> That's a good point. It's a good point. We do it. I, I'm not going to deny that. That's fair. Um, all right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So this is how I'm going to start out. Um, I have a directory called Docker Cache. And like I said, I wanted to use Copilot to deploy this. And uh, Docker actually provides the registry image. So there's really not a lot of software for me to manage myself. Um, the one thing that I might, and in fact do, want to be able to do is modify the config for the registry. So here's a little trick, by the way. If you're planning to run something that is someone else's image, but you just need to tweak it just a little bit, Docker is great for that, Docker the, the mechanism. So my Docker file looks like this. From registry, and I'm picking the version, pinning it to a sort of major release version 2.7. Uh, that's going to incorporate Docker's image. And then the only thing I'm doing is just copying in my own config file into the place that it needs to go. And that's it. So uh, from here, every change that I need to make is here in config.yaml. And is that big enough? A little bigger. Yeah. A little bigger. Yeah. yeah. It's tough to see. All right. Let's see here. Uh, user settings. Scroll. I made the terminal big, but I never I got just, around to making the. Font I feel big. like every time we do this, we should play Benny Hill music in the background. You know, like because it's always a circus to try to figure that out. Totally. Uh, let me show you another little trick. Um, if you Docker run, let's see here. So I wanted to get a copy of the default config uh, because I wanted to be able to um, I wanted to be able to you know like just modify it instead of having to compose it all from scratch. Um, so I'm running the registry image and I'm passing in a command cat and the config file, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna redirect that into config.yaml.orig. So it's pulling it down for me and done. So let's take a look real quick. I now have config.yaml.orig. 
and then of course the one myconfig.yaml. So I, I don't know about you, but I love using vimdiff in this situation. So config.yaml and config.yaml.orig. And I've already modified my config just a little bit, but let's take a look at what the modifications are. Um, so everywhere that's highlighted is a modification. So I turned on uh, debug logging, and I'm actually going to turn that back off because there was really nothing useful that I found in there. And let me write and quit and bring it up again to make it a little bit easier to see. The only other difference is I added in this config proxy and then remote URL that I am proxying upstream to, and that is registry1.docker.io. That's it. So I'm taking the default config and I'm adding in an additional uh, parameter. I could have probably even done this with, a, with an environment variable and it would have been even easier. Then I don't even have to modify the config, but because I'm using Copilot and I want to have a Docker file anyway, um, since I have a Docker file, I may as well do something with it. So that was the thinking. And by the way, um, so with ECS, and I don't, I don't believe there's Fargate support yet, but this just seems like a, a great opportunity to mention uh, environment file files file support in ECS. So mm, yeah. if you have a config file that you are sharing across multiple environments, you could use environment files. You could have an environment file in S3 and then parameterize certain values in that file and oh, based yeah, on environment cool. would be different. Yeah, so. that'd be cool. So like your production environment would have different parameters than your um, testing environment. Yeah, yeah. So that's just something that came to mind. It's EC2 backed uh, tasks right now, but I, I believe Fargate support is coming for that as well. Nice. That makes sense because I mean Fargate can read from S3, so yeah, that'd be pretty easy. I say that, and the service team is like, "It's not that easy, <laughs> right? Right? Like, <laughs> you, you know, it's like look at the scale they work at. Like, come on, right? It, yeah, it, it sounds I didn't mean easy. to didn't mean to trivialize that, but um, but yeah, I mean, like, it's that would be awesome. Okay, now walk me through Copilot again. So I start off with. Copilot. Oh, by the way, Cloud9, did you know it had Brew? So, like, I did know this. Brew install Copilot is what I did uh, before we started. And it, like, Cloud9 has Homebrew on it. And so, game changer. Yeah, it's awesome. Am I it's updating Copilot? I didn't know I was going to get a new Copilot when I did this. That's kind of surprising. Looks like dependencies. Hmm. It's did I do the right thing? Is it, I'm not even. This probably isn't even the right copilot. This is probably a different one, isn't it? Uh, does it say AWS tap anywhere? Yeah, you're probably installing some random weird copilot. <laughs> it's gonna Bitcoin mine on <laughs> my on my. Uh, dang it! Hey, great great job, Brent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's probably. Copilot CLI. Let's do uh, AWS Copilot Fargate GitHub. And, and then you go to install. Brew install AWS tap Copilot CLI. That's ah, why. This is why you should look at the instructions. This is this is good. Brew okay. install. Yeah. Yeah. That nice. would have been better to do. All right, learn from my mistake. Uh, so let's brew and install. Wait, yeah, I'm in the right place. Brew uninstall copilot, because who knows what that is. And let's brew install AWS tap copilot CLI. It's all good, it's already there. Uh, but if you didn't have it, then it would install it for you. That was my whole point. I shouldn't have even taken that little deviation. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, all right. Where, where are we at comment-wise? Well, I mean, I think we're... So there was a question from, yeah, from NetHole here. Yeah, perhaps it'll be, be identified later, but I'm curious about space required for caching with this container image as I saw no reference to sizing or volume for persistence. And yeah, 
So we're going to, again, we'll talk, we're going to do it in a super basic non-production sort of way just to kind of get started, get the discussion going, and then we'll think through some some options that we can that we can take from there. Uh, okay, so Copilot init. Yep. Uh, what would you like to name your application? Let's name it um, Docker Cache. And it's, we're going to make this a load balanced web service, and I'm going to name my web service Docker Cache also. And my Docker file is here. And I happen to know that the registry listens on port 5000. Probably should have put that in the Docker file. Yep. And there was a question. Can we provide mm -hmm. some documentation for examples on end files? Yes. I will post that in the chat shortly. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> Alex Masha, Copilot just works. Three clicks done. Uh, exactly. We're going to see that now. Um, so what's happening under the covers, uh, let's just go take a look real quick at my console. Um, so I had this up earlier, and you see that my Cloud9 instance was really the only CloudFormation stack that I had in this region. And now uh, Copilot is coming along and provisioning some additional stacks for me. So it starts off bringing up a, uh, a set of IAM roles, and then it uses those IAM roles to provision the additional uh, resources. So we're going to end up with an ECS cluster, uh, a load balancer, a VPC, um, and then a Fargate task running that uh, is going to be my Docker file. Uh, in fact, here we go. So. You're all set for local development. Would you like to deploy a test environment? And yes, I would. And that's going to be what brings up uh, all the infrastructure. Yes. Boy, that was really easy. This is, again, this is why I go back to using Copilot. It's just, you have an idea and you want to just do it. Yeah. Copilot, it's just easy. I mean, we're experimenting here, you know, like that we can try something out super easy. We don't have to have a big commitment. We don't have to go to IT and ask them for, you know, can you give me some servers? Um, you know, we're just going to try something out and uh, we're going to maybe tweak it. And then if we like it, cool. If we want to continue to evolve it, cool. So, um, so yeah. All right, let's check out CloudFormation again. So uh, this is my, uh, I, th I like to think of this as the big stack. Um, so you can see the resources that get provisioned in this. We have, this is where the cluster gets provisioned, the uh, ELB, or sorry, the ALB and the target group. Um, we have some security groups, um, et cetera, et cetera. Oh yeah, private DNS namespace for service discovery. Um, so yeah, some good stuff in here. And then as this uh, comes up, we're going to then uh, be able to deploy our container into this infrastructure. So this is our sort of base layer of infrastructure. And once it's uh, up and available, then uh, we'll be able to start using it. And this is our test environment. We could do a completely separate environment for production. So we're just going to stick with test today because that's what we're doing is testing. I'm, I'm looking. Oh, yeah. Sorry. My. My screensaver came on and I think that killed my screen share. So there we go. All right, so we're waiting on the ALB to come up and go go uh, uh, cut to come up and go healthy. Um, <laughs> this is so funny, mainly because it's not the first time uh, I've heard him called this. But yeah, where did Jake Gyllenhaal go? Uh, I don't know. He'll he'll be back. I saw him. I saw him pop back in. I think he might have had to reboot. 
and the internet didn't cache his connection. <laughs> That's uh, so true. There is no cache for Adam. There he is. I, I am I okay? Am I coming in okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm having some problems. Sorry. Sorry. That's no, all right. That's what I assumed. Uh, everyone saying there he went. There he went. <laughs> <laughs> like no, like my mute button's gone. I don't know what's going on. I think it's Chrome is messing with me right now. Oh crap! So I think I'm okay though. It, it so far. Let's see. Hey, I just saw your note about having some troubles. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you got that. <laughs> <laughs> so where That's we at? Right. So we're sitting here. Uh, we're just waiting on the ALB to finish up. Let's check out the CloudFormation uh, stack one more time. Let's do a little reload. And yeah, this public load balancer. You know, I feel like that's what I'm always waiting on is ALB so or, or NAT gateway. It's usually NAT gateway to delete or ALB to create. I don't know why. I never, I never actually see the ALB delete. Because that just, I think, might be able to happen like with a lot of other things. And that gateway, I never see it create because, again, that probably happens with a lot of other things. But when I'm like, why is this taking so long? It, I check and it's always ALB create or not gateway delete. So, yeah, there, there, there's some, look, listen, there's just like random things. Like I, deleting a Lambda function in a VPC sometimes takes a while. Like it's, we all have, you know, these weird little quirks, but we work through them. Uh, I really like what Nethole said here. I didn't choose the Zoom life. The Zoom life chose me. I like that. <laughs> That's the motto we live by in 2020. Man, no doubt. All right. We have a new stack set coming in. Uh, Docker cache infrastructure. Nice. And in here, oh, we can go back and let's look at the terminal. Um, so we're now coming up. We're linking the account uh, to application and what what's happening is we're provisioning a an ECR repository, KMS key, S3 bucket, all that stuff. This is where all of our uh, service artifacts are going to end up going. And um, as soon as these are healthy and ready to go, we'll see us build the container and push it into ECR. Yep. So pretty cool stuff. All again, super easy. And like, I didn't have to do these 87 steps. Uh, you know, Copilot's just taking care of everything for me. That's nice, you know? It's really nice. <laughs> it's awesome. And I don't, I mean, I know we've mentioned it before, but I don't think we've said it today. This is all deploying out on the Fargate. So I don't even have to like have capacity uh, you know, available to to do an experiment like this. I'm actually, um, you know, deploying a pretty big container. I didn't, I didn't show you this. Let me show you my manifest. And I just want, while you're doing this, I just want to say, like, again, for entry point, I don't have to think about a cluster. I don't have to manage or secure um, all the cluster configurations it's a fully managed control plane and in with fargate the data plane is fully managed i literally just have a container that i want to run i forgot how do you oh they got rid of the c9 command line dang it okay no big deal so we'll go into copilot we want to like it's just just npm i dash g c9 that'll install the c9 I dash, yeah, I, and that, no, yeah, I, this always confuses me. NPM I dash G, and am I still coming through okay, by the way? Yeah. And then C9. Now do C9 open, and then that'll open it in the thing. If that's, I don't even know if that's what you were trying to do. Yeah, yeah, it used to actually come installed. Um, that was my whole, that was what I was trying to do right there. Um, all right, so let's check out the manifest real quick, <laughs> Nano. Uh, yeah, I was about to go to Vim, but it feels weird to open, like, it actually doesn't feel weird. It should feel weird to open a text file in Vim, 
when you're using an IDE. So like, you know, the terminal of the IDE isn't meant for using Vim. But at the same time, like I find myself opening text files in Vim in this IDE all the time. So the solution to that is if you're like us and you're just, you love Vim bindings, which I do, you just set your IDE bindings to Vim and it's like Vim. And I have that, but then you still have to remember to not type Vim. Or and... you do what I do and you alias Vim equals C9 open and you never have to Vim on in the command line. What it's a win-win, Brent. What does that do when you do a git commit? Does it open the git commit oh. message in, in Cloud9? It's a good question. Uh, I don't remember. I'd be curious. We should try it. Um, all right, so look, look, back to this manifest. I had already created this. Uh, Copilot c generates it for you if if you don't have it. So don't you know? Don't worry about that. Some of the questions that it asked uh, populated this manifest. Like uh, you know, it asked about port five thousand. The only thing that I changed was uh, the CPU and memory. And because I know you know the, I think the question came up earlier about sizing and everything. Um, I know that I'm going to be running, you know, what amounts to an in-memory cache. I want as much memory as I can get. And uh, so 30 gigs of RAM and uh, four CPUs is kind of a not the largest Fargate container you can run, but it's up there. It's near the largest. Um, so it smells a lot like a Windows <laughs> Windows <laughs> requirement there. Woo! That's heavy. <laughs> Well, the, the thing, it's what you do with it, right? And so because it's still Linux, we're going to be doing a lot of really efficient stuff with it. We just are going to have a lot of room to be able to do it. And, you know, some of those some of those images can be really big. And the metadata is going to, you know, is going to get cached in memory. The, the layers are going to get cached on the local file system. And, yeah, it's going to be cool. And so there was a comment about Fargate, you know, cost wise. And yeah. I, I just want to say that. So, yes, I mean, I guess if you're paying out of your own pocket, there are considerations there. But Copilot, especially if you're paying out of your own pocket, is even um, better than doing this on your own because uh, on your own, meaning you build the cluster and all that, because um it's built in a, a public subnet. There's no NAT gateway, so there's some cost savings measures that already take place by using Copilot. So exactly, yeah. So and I mean, you could do those things too. You know, you could certainly uh, not build a NAT gateway, but um, at this point, you know, it's it's going to be about the same, and it's it's pretty easy. Here we are, one command, and I have. You know, I have a container up and running, and let's just test it out real quick. Uh, so this is the the URL, uh, curl to this URL colon p2 underscore catalog, and great, it responded, and I have zero things cached. Now, by the way, I'm not again. This is not for production. I'm not suggesting that you do this because a right now this is exposed to the public. Um, B, there's, it's not TLS right now. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of things that you would still want to change from here. We're just doing this as an experiment. Um, all right, what can we do now? So we have our, we have our stuff deployed. We have our uh, container. How do we set up our client to be able to use this cache? That's the next question. So when you run Docker pull um, Redis, what ends up happening is you talk to the Docker daemon, and the Docker daemon goes and downloads Redis. It reaches out to the official uh, place since we didn't specify since part, the name didn't include an address, then it thinks I need to go look for look for, at Docker Hub for this. So it's going to go download the Redis image from Docker Hub. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. How long did that take? Uh, sorry, not long. 
<laughs> how long did I'm just gonna fix the command. Full. Oh, sorry, something else popped to my mind while you're doing that. Also Fargate Spot. There's Fargate Spot oh, yeah. available for cost yeah. savings. That Considerable would be savings. Yeah, that's true. All right, so about three and a half seconds uh, to pull Redis from Docker Hub. And I mean, that's fast, right? Let's face it, Docker Hub is like super optimized. They have uh, all kinds of stuff working in their favor. Uh, I don't know where they run, but you know, it's probably close to the Bay Area uh, where where this instance happens to be running. So, yeah, it's it's fast. It's good stuff. But let's see let's see what happens if we enable caching. So, in um, Etsy Docker daemon.json, we can actually set up two parameters in, in this particular case. One is registry mirror, and the other is insecure registries. And the reason you need both is because register because I'm running an insecure registry mirror. So these two commands together basically combine to allow me to talk to an insecure proxy. And the proxy uh, is this endpoint that Copilot spit out for me. So this Docker public for W0, um, I just pasted it in to the config and let's restart Docker. And let's grab a new terminal. And let's just see, uh, let's see, how do I look at logs with Copilot? Copilot um, uh, SVC logs. And then it, it'll just, yeah, recognize and you can follow, yeah. Sweet. Uh, yeah, I don't want the health check logs. So, rep v. v. Nice. Okay. So now I'm looking at the logs and you'll see that I'm going to actually lower this a little bit more and you'll see that if I curl my endpoint, get the catalog, I have nothing cached and we then get a log entry a few seconds later from that curl, you know, here's, here's my curl. So I'm definitely talking to this service. This service is responding and all that good stuff. If I, now, if I um, Docker pull Redis, what's gonna end up happening is I'm gonna reach out to this proxy and there's gonna be a cache miss. So the proxy is going to download Redis for me and uh, then serve it back out. So uh, the first time through, it might actually not even be as fast. And in fact, yeah, it was slightly slower four seconds instead of three seconds. Um, but let's remove the image again. And this time we should have that image cached. And are you so pulling we, are you pulling Redis because it's a in memory cache and you want to showcase bit. the cache with a, a in memory? Bit. Okay. Uh, Just, you know, I was thinking in memory and then I was thinking what should I pull? And Redis, yeah, kind of kind of made me think of it. Also I couldn't decide if I should pull a gigantic image or if I should pull a small image because this test isn't quite fair um, because there's still extract time. You know, like I had to I had to download the layers, but then I had to extract them. And there's no way for me to really have an accurate measurement of how much time was spent extracting. So like, I don't know of this. So I definitely got faster. I got a second faster than using no proxy um, by by having the proxy in place. So I think that definitely helped my download time, but my extract time is still in here too. And it, and they kind of happen interspersed. So there's not even really a <laughs> Texan Raj pull a .NET image. Yeah, so uh, there wasn't, uh, what, what was I pulling earlier that was just huge? Um, That one, Rhodium. Uh, so let's just grab this one real quick. And again, this is going to be, it's what I think what I realized is 
the the huger the image, the more time is spent extracting and sort of decompressing the layers once they're downloaded. So the effect in the in the time, the wall clock time, is harder to spot. Um, but I'm going to do it for Tex and Raj anyway, uh, because this thing is just huge. And we'll we'll just scroll up a little bit here. So you can see I'm pulling many, many layers. Uh, it's uh, hundreds. And if, in fact, this is going to be gigs of data. Are the intermediate images also cached? Yeah, every layer is cached. That's what's really cool about this is, um, you know, like, Let's say I've, I'm updating something, my own container on Docker Hub, and all of my sub layers are staying the same, and I'm really only changing the final layer. Um, in that situation, I'm really only going to be downloading that new final layer from Docker Hub, and everything else is going to come uh, straight out of cache. So uh, you, d you definitely are going to save by doing this. <laughs> Nethole. Uh, yo, dog, we heard you like in memory caches. <laughs> That's hilarious. Boke Joe wants to know do you have some timeout notification type of thing for the spot instance for Fargate? And yeah, you get a two minute warning if I remember correctly. Yep. And I was actually, I want to find, I was just actually looking for um, a doc to send you on that. Nice. So, That's yeah. probably better. But it, the, your that your answer was correct, right? That's sweet. There's that. Just a deep dive into that, and I believe it goes over sp uh, how to handle spot uh, termination notices. Yeah. But you see what I'm talking about here? We're still extracting. The downloads for all the layers are all complete, complete at this point. And what we're sitting here waiting on is just extracting the huge, huge layers. And those have to go sequentially one by one. So whether or not this is an improvement over not going through the proxy, it's just too hard to spot. I couldn't come up with a good way to just download without extracting, you know, using some using native tools. I could have probably, I don't know, rigged something up with curl or or something like that but but i wanted this to you know be as close to uh representative as possible so i think actually the best example is using using smaller images that that extract really fast um and that way you'll just see you know like a, a second improvement from three and a half seconds to two and a half seconds that's substantial so um yeah. so yeah all right, so that was two minutes and 40 seconds. Let's uh, prune. And by the way, if you've never run this command, read about it before you do. This is going to delete every image uh, on your client. But if you, I will say, I've, you know, this was, I, I've run out of disk space. I'm like, how did I possibly run out of disk space? And then I remember, let's run a Docker system prune, prune and all of a sudden, all my disk space is back. Totally. You know, if I'm building a ton of images. But check this out. Like, we are done as far as download goes, and that was five seconds or so. So, I, I mean, I definitely think that we can spot, you know, ad hoc, we can spot that it was much faster than before. Uh, as far as downloading these, you know, this is a 10 gig image. Um, so it's huge improvement as long as we're willing to accept that that was sort of me counting in my head, you know, and not uh, a time measurement that's going to spit out on the command line. Yeah. But I still think this is going to be faster than two minutes and 40 seconds. We'll just wait till the end and see. But but the comparison is two minutes and 40 seconds. Um, so we'll see how much the, how much faster this gets. Yeah. It's always nice to do this in cloud nine because you get to take advantage of the speed. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, this is running on a, an M5 4X large, I believe. And um, you know, it has super fast networking. It's in a data center, so it should be reliable uh, networking, not not you know, my home network that is bursting at the seams. Right. I feel you there. 
man, maybe this will end up being two minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> Kind of like watching a pot boil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Minute 34. So, I mean, it's still clearly faster. I would expect the extract time to have been roughly the same as before. So we cut, you know, a little over a minute off of the total amount of time spent. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like the improvements there. And that's just bandwidth that I didn't have to spend. And imagine if I was having like whatever this image is. If I was having to do this across a fleet of servers over and over and over again, caching helps. And if we go back to our catalog command, uh, just curl the endpoint slash v2 slash underscore catalog, that shows us that we now have these two images in cache. So we nice. can easily see that uh, that these are available and they're gonna they're gonna be a cache hit. Uh, when we when anything else comes along to pull these images. So let's talk real quick about what's missing from this, right? So one, uh, TLS. Now, I, I did read that the Docker registry has Let's Encrypt uh, available to it, so you can like incorporate those two things together. But you would need to own a domain, and I wasn't really ready to do that for this demo today. So, um, so we didn't demo that. And then another thing would be if this container restarts, what happens? Um, well, bye bye. Yeah, no more cache, right? Um, and maybe that's okay. Like there are situations where I'm I'm totally fine with that. Uh, that's definitely the simplest way to handle cache invalidation and to handle cache management. Um, but you could, if you wanted to, actually shift the storage uh, off to S3. And uh, Docker registry actually includes some config uh, to be able to store images in S3. And then it also, Docker registry includes some config to be able to store and, and write its own cache, its own metadata cache out to Redis. So if you wanted to do those things, what does that open the door for? Well, one of the things that it opens the door for is multiple of these running. So right now we have we have one, and you could think of it as a single point of failure. And um, if it's not available, there's there's a, luckily there is a timeout. Your client will then reach directly to Docker Hub and pull. And it won't just give up and fail, uh, but it'll add some time to the Docker pool. It'll add like a few seconds to the Docker pool. And I, I think that's actually awesome that, that they built the client that way. Um, but two, if you have multiples, maybe you want them to share the storage. So having that S3 backend uh, allows them to do that. Having uh, the Redis uh, for metadata storage allows them to do that. Um, the downside is now you're managing Redis, you're managing S3, and you do potentially have to figure out how do I uh, garbage collect out of that S3 bucket and get rid of images that are no longer referenced by any of the manifests. So you could trade all that away with just uh, run, you know, run this from in memory. And then if it happens to restart, oh well, uh, we'll just warm that cache right back up every time we Docker pull from that point forward. So to me, that's probably how I would start off is I would deploy this to my environment and I would just keep it in memory and have that, you know, have that just rewarm. So then the other question is how do you incorporate it in with, you know, your cluster? Maybe you're using EKS. You could potentially have one of these deployed onto every single node as a daemon set. And you could have caching down at the, at the host layer. Um, or you could have one or two of them deployed on the cluster and have caching just at the cluster layer. Um, it's up to you. Uh, you know, giving up 30 gig, in, the, in our specific example, we're taking up 30 gigs of RAM. So I don't think I would do a daemon set that way. But... I and yeah. there was a, a comment from NetHole on the permission love here. But, you know, keep in mind, whether it's EKS, ECS, you know, EKS, there's IAM roles for service accounts. So you ensure that whenever you're running, 
um, you you attach an IAM role that gives it the minimal permissions, right, that it needs. Yeah, and I was going to point out that uh, Docker even documents that. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. So this is their documentation. Registry is a pull-through cache. And um, let me search for S3. It's not on here. All right, uh, let's see here. S3, storage configuration options, S3, drivers reference. I, I remember tracking this down earlier today just because I thought it could come up. And there it is. So we're looking at the storage driver for S3. And this is uh, Docker. This is Docker's GitHub, uh, docker.github.io. And the S3 permission scope, you can see we're allowing uh, for the bucket name, we're allowing list multi. This is the minimum set right here. So you could totally take this and turn it into a set of permissions. And uh, you're only allowing a few permissions to only the bucket name and the, the objects under the bucket name. And uh, they've documented everything that you need. So you could totally do that if you want to, or again, keep it super simple and just keep everything in memory and on the file system. And that's that's totally fine too. Yep. All right. But yeah, and just in the context of ECS, you can just attach an IAM role, take that policy. If you were using S3 attached to the IAM role, attach that to your task. Bada bing, bada boom. Bada bing, bada boom, exactly. Uh, so yeah, um, that's it. What I'd like to find out is if anyone's gonna, if anyone takes this and uh, you know integrates it into the, into your environment, tell us about it. I want to hear about it. I want to know like what did you do? How did you continue forward with it from here? Um, you know what what's the net effect that that you saw? Um, you know anything improved? Uh, but yeah, here we went from literally zero to running in uh, a few minutes, a lot of talking, and um, and we have you know a functional cache that is caching layers. Fantastic. So then I guess that's it for today. It's, as as you all may know, it's containers from the Couch Friday, so. That's right. <laughs> uh, so so we, Monday, yeah. Justin's gonna be on, and uh, he's gonna talk to us about, funny enough, more registry tooling. Uh, and I'm gonna leave it kind of generic like that to let him uh, flex over the weekend and figure out exactly what what it's gonna be. But we're gonna keep it, we're gonna keep talking about registry and and uh, image management and and stuff like that. And he's gonna take a look at some tooling that uh, that he thinks is pretty cool and he's gonna show it to us and and we'll uh, sit around and discuss it. Beautiful. Well, I guess then we are we are good to go. Thank you, everybody, for watching. As always, we appreciate you very much. Um, follow our YouTube channel if you're interested. If you want to get notified, subscribe, not follow. Right, that's the right word. Subscribe. Yeah, and then smash the bell. I think is is the way you put it. Smash the button. Smash the like. Subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so cheesy. I'm sorry. That's um, right. But uh, yeah. Oh. No sub follow. Well, sub follow. I don't know what that means. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. What's a sub follow? Uh, we got oh, Edge Geek. Uh, Edge Geek. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But also, I definitely recommend, hey, checking out his show. Uh, Absolutely. Sam. What was Sam from Sam the couch? Sam from the sofa? <laughs> Sam, Sam on, on the sod. Uh, yeah. Sam down the slide. Which one? <laughs> It's regardless, it's a great show. And, and, it is. Uh, oh, it is. And he Eric's was saying awesome. it's subscribe and follow. Thank you, Eric. We we don't, we, we're not good at this. <laughs> anyway, All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Have a great weekend.